welcome to another campaign diary and Q&A here on Slice and Dice, talking about everything that went down in session 22. No, 20... Yes, 22. Oh, I'm getting so confused with the numbers now. Anyway, the 20-something session of uh, the Many Lands campaign. But before um, sort of delving into that, I wanted to actually take, take a moment to, um, to address some other stuff that's been going on uh, for those of you who aren't aware, uh, in the UK, we had a very important day yesterday, uh, being the general election. And for many, uh, particularly uh, around my age group and in my social circles and whatnot, uh, not a day that went particularly well, um, not getting the desired result from it. Um, and I just kind of wanted to um, just say a couple of things, just kind of through a D&D &D filter, just to kind of... I guess to put across some some hope, some optimism, and basically a different way of looking at things when things don't go your way. Um, I think one of the main draws that I had personally uh, with Dungeons and Dragons is that as a game, as a role playing game, it's a lot to do with uh, loss. Loss is one of the biggest themes within it, although it's not spoken about that much. It's really the the most heartfelt moments the bits that you really get absorbed into the game are all to do with losing uh whether it's the boss fight that you lose or it's the party member that gets killed when things don't go your way it's when the campaign itself kind of the low points but the points that it, it really comes together it's in times of adversity when you need to pull together with your party and your friends and loved ones around you and strive to do better and strive to have uh, and to make tomorrow a better day so in the so in the moment of the day you may be feeling down you may be feeling dejected and upset that's normal and you've got to ride that out but you've got to, uh, you need to take the time that you need and then when you can pick yourself back up pick those around you back up and move on to the next fight and live to fight another day and uh, in D&D &D, one of the uh, as I said one of the biggest things is when a party member dies and they're not brought back and it's heartbreaking and it's horrible uh, like I said loss is a big theme um, and coping with that loss and learning how to deal with it is a big theme and it's not easy to do it takes time but over time it gets easier so for those of you who are <laughs> feeling feeling pretty bad today uh things didn't go your way i guess i'm kind of included in that just have hope that things uh, that this is now the time that you need to pull together with those around you and uh, look to make things better for tomorrow just hold the ones that you hold dear, hold them close, support them, and they'll support you. It's teamwork. Again, a massive theme of D&D. Teamwork. Working together uh, for justice, for overthrowing the bad guys, for making things better. Again, it's a powerful theme. So there's my D&D filter on how things went uh, with the election yesterday. And above all else, um, you can, if nothing else... Uh, use a game such as this for a bit of escapism to go into a fantasy world delve into that high fantasy into that lore and forget about some of the troubles and the reality of your existence there are cathartic moments there are bits that we can identify with but there's also escapism in there too so lots of things i think for the dmd community <laughs> for those of you in there who are feeling down and dejected today i hope that uh, this lovely game helps you feel just a little bit better. So anyway, that's all I wanted to, to say about that. So uh, shelve that, put that to one side. Let's talk about everything that went down in the last session. Uh, so, as I said, session 22, because now we're into the 20s, I just get the dates mixed up all the time. Uh, I'll probably stop signposting the dates from now on, <laughs> just to make it a little bit simpler. But I should say we've got one session to go, until uh, until the end of 2019, and that's going to be coming up on Monday. So 
in a sense, it's our Christmas special. I'll tr maybe putting a couple of little festive bits into the stream, depending on whether it's relevant. Um, but once that's taken care of, uh, we'll be taking two weeks off and then we'll be coming back in 2020 in, I believe it's the second week of January. In fact, I'm going to pull up the date now. <clears throat> it will be the Monday, the 6th of January is when we'll be back. And I'll put this all on the Twitch channel as well. Um, just so that you're all aware that <laughs> that we're away for the Christmas period and we're going to be back in the new year. Um, but before we get to that point, um, there's some exciting things underway, which hopefully we'll be launching. Well, if not launching on Monday, we'll be launching in the new year. Some exciting stuff um, I've been working in the background on. Um, I don't want to say any more about it just now, but uh, uh, let's just say that we're growing, we're trying new things, and uh, we've got some very exciting things coming up in the new year. <laughs> I won't say any more about that. On to session 22, though. So um, so last time, our party were um, uh, had caused, well, they had uh, by accident caused a riot in the uh, village of uh, uh, Oroglor uh, due to their, um, a, a, a uh, their sort of investigation into um, Dean Fringe um, and his delivery. He had a note um, saying to collect half the money, the second half of the payment from uh, from the miners' arms, and to tell Hogarth that Fang sent them. So the group decided to follow up this lead, and Seth, um, the rogue of the party, uh, and also seemingly the most charismatic at the time, or at least the most believable, took on this role. Pretended that he was either I think I think they opted on him being um, basically Dean's replacement uh, and uh, asking Hogarth, who turns out is the barkeeper, to um, uh, that he's come to collect the second half of the money. What was suspicious about this was that Hogarth knew that the second half of the money had already been collected by Dean Fringe. So then somebody else coming, this is clearly suspicious, and uh, sensed there was something wrong, and so he. Um, got his uh, uh, they, they got his uh, some hired thugs to go and deal with Seth at the meeting now he uh, wasn't aware however that all the rest of the party uh, that Seth wasn't alone and the rest of the party had kind of surreptitiously entered into the bar and so when things started going wrong outside fortunately at least one of the party was uh, perceptive enough to hear what was going on and Brucon uh, the, dwarf, the dwarf monk proving himself to be rather um, untrusting of people and I think that kind of plays in from his character background as much as anything uh, and so when he saw Seth leave he decided to kind of stealth outside and just kind of stalk him and see what was going on and that way he was there to kind of ambush the uh, the ambush the ambushers so uh, so fortunately Seth was saved and everything everything worked out and they managed to take uh, two of the thugs hostage one of them being killed by Neris's uh, swarm of rats from her, her Rat King's staff quite a dark move from Neris and actually that wasn't the last and we saw in this session um, that um, kind of these these more um, uh, m uh, m I was going to say like masochistic kind of tendencies but anyway these more psychopathic tendencies of, of uh, Neris coming out which caused some suspicion but um, first of all, um, the party had to deal with um, an interrogation of sorts, uh, a questioning. Now, Seth had, in the, at the end of um, the last session, had um, been interrogating these three thugs and trying to get information through intimidation. Um, and I think what was highlighted <laughs> this time was that actually interrogating somebody and, and uh, torturing them not the most reliable way of getting information. I mean, sure, you'll get the, uh, you'll get what you want to hear, but whether that's accurate or not is another thing entirely. Um, and so a different tack was taken this time uh, with Brucon, um, trying to be a lot more reasonable uh, and uh, persuasive rather than um, using his uh, rather than using his strength and his uh, and punishment. It's basically giving carrot rather than. Uh, giving carrots rather than stick to the NPC, and it was a tactic that worked. Uh, although Hogarth was uh, attempted to, to lie and fabricate in places, Brucon, being the wise monk that he is, managed to see through 
uh, a lot of this. Um, and Hogarth revealed that um, how he kind of came into uh, working with Fang, um, he revealed that he'd actually never met uh, uh, he'd never met Fang, and then in fact he was left a note along with some uh, along with the payment money and some coin for himself, basically on his doorstep. Um, so all done kind of uh, under subterfuge, middle of the night, kind of closed door stuff. Yes, he admitted that he took the money and he obeyed what the letter told him because it had his name on it and I guess uh, some paranoia kind of came into that like if they know who I am then they're probably watching right now I better do it so um so that came into play and he revealed that he received a note and then um lied by saying that he destroyed the note because apparently that's what it said on it but actually he kept it in his strong box uh, so this was a lead um for Brucon to go off now, now behind the dm screen None of this had been planned. <laughs> I thought, you know, okay, question away. I'll say that uh, uh, I, I had it at the idea in my head that if um, this was delved into, that uh, Hogarth would say that, yeah, he got a note, uh, and that was the way of doing it. However, I didn't anticipate the party would, uh, would uh, follow up this lead quite so stringently. Um, and so this whole the note being kept in a strong box red herring came into play um so yeah he eventually revealed that it had been left in the strong box and of course uh by this point it being in the strong box proved to be a bit of a problem because the bar had uh, the strong box was kept under the bar and the bar had just been ransacked uh by uh, the uh, by the village people not the bank obviously um and uh, so when they went to investigate, in fact, when Brucon called on the services of Seth to investigate the bar and search for things, basically found, yeah, this is being picked clean, so that might be in the wind, that particular lead. Anyway, they decided to, to follow it up, um, uh, follow up nonetheless, questioned the, one of the, the one thug that was willing to give information, the uh, ambushes. This was the one that Howland had maimed by cutting off his hand, a disarm attack that was a critical success to say um, <laughs> um who, this this thug revealed himself to be alan because we decided that the next npc uh, that i didn't have a name for uh, would be called alan because that was alan was also the name of the winner of our uh, tabletop crafter giveaway for the dice bag bundle so a uh, little name check for alan there you've got your own npc who's a little bit maimed but anyway um so the whole idea with alan was that he uh, he was the one who'd been tortured uh, and already been maimed and Essentially, he was worried that he was going to go. Get, he was going to get killed, just like uh, one of his compatriots had uh, by Neris's uh, Rat King staff. So he made up this story, uh, knowing that there was a shrubbery just outside the village, and just said, "Look, look, look we, we meet over there. Uh, just, just, you know, you'll you'll probably find Fang there." And basically, he was just trying to buy time in the hopes that maybe there'll be a window of opportunity for him to escape, or else that he could appeal to some of the other. Uh, character's good nature and so what ended up happening was we had uh, a group of adventurers going out, out of town to look for it including a uh, fleeting look uh, now fleeting um the player dan was away uh, on the last session uh, in fact the last couple but he was back this time so now we can focus a little bit more on what uh, he was doing and he'd been left outside to look after the carriage and look after the statue that they finally found of Lady Helene uh, Grenfell that's there uh, Garni because it's her in her petrified form. It's a long story, but if, you, if you've seen previous campaign diaries, you know what that storyline's all about. Um, so he was there guarding that, and following this kind of note, um, the the uh, the strong box note, um, little uh, side quest, um, <laughs> I decided to throw in there. Let's just throw this note at Fleeting Look, like literally, as if the gods are watching over him. That they've just let just a uh, strong wind has just blown this note literally into Fleeting Look's lap. Um, because unlike most of the other characters, you don't really know what Fleeting Look's going to do. <laughs> uh, he tends to do things that are a little bit unexpected, uh, and so um, he decided to look intently at this note without actually touching it, being very kind of suspicious of it, which I thought was interesting. Um, so I made him do a perception check. And yeah, uh, on his second perception check, he decided to look at it more rather than picking it up uh, after he couldn't tell what it was. Rolled a natural one. Um, so I'd, so with that, so I thought, it's time for a bit of fun. Now, Fleeting Look is from uh, Kothar, 
um, which Neris is also from. A little bit of uh, interesting backstory there. And Kothar um, was um, in the law was basically um, once um, the stronghold, once the the domain of um, a an enormous red dragon uh, by name of Ushtag the Deceiver. Now he uh, uh, since the time of Ushtag. It has uh, been a land that's been permeated by magic within. The, so the 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 sands of themselves are scorched. Um, nothing much grows there, but there seems to be a strange arcane energy in and around uh, Kothar, unlike uh, you'd see anywhere else within the many lands. And so those who are born there, or those who have spent most of their years there, um, develop strange magical powers. And this is one of the custom backgrounds I came up with for the campaigns called the Cathar, uh, the Cathar Born. Basically, um, you get, um, I think you get a couple of skill proficiencies, but you also get a, a free cantrip. You get prestidigitation, which you can perform not only at will, but also without using any somatic or uh, verbal components or material components is i can't remember which component i think it's ver verbal and somatic you normally need you don't need any components for it you can cast it just with a thought in the same way as a sorcerer's subtle spell would work that you don't even you don't need to make any kind of gesticulation you don't give any clue that you're doing the spell you can just do it so <laughs> going back to this natural one he stares intently at this note and then his strange magical powers then cause it this note to just burn to a crisp and just evaporate um so it's a fun little moment but again because the rest of the party weren't there it was just the cat it was just the players then going oh no <laughs> that's our lead and he's just burned it um yeah just a fun little moment there anyway fleeting look um was <laughs> advised to get um to not only um but by, by mawa this was not only to guard uh, and to watch over um, the statue which he would, had fixed his gaze onto the entire time the group had been inside but also being told to um, advised by Mao that he really needs to keep the statue within his eye line but also needs to be keeping a lookout around for um, for suspicious persons and so on and hopefully he'd see the note um, <laughs> so Fleeting decided that he wanted to stand the statue up because then he could sit on top of it and then he could look around and uh, it, he'd get a much better vantage point from being at a higher elevation, but also uh, it, it wouldn't be able to go missing because he'd be sitting on it. Smart. Uh, so he asked his um, <laughs> his uh, superior officer from the Order of the Broken Fang, uh, Rexland Swordclaw, who's um, tagged along with the party uh, under this uh, for, for this werewolf um, uh, situation that seems to be unraveling before them. And <laughs> Um, with some um, some convincing, uh, got Rexland to go and look for wood to uh, essentially prop up the statue with, to, just to ensure that the statue doesn't fall over when they stand it up vertically. Um, yeah, anyway, that never came to pass because before that happened, uh, Fleeting, uh, while well, in fact Rexland was looking for wood, uh, Fleeting went along with Seth and Neris and Brucon and their uh, captive Alan to go to this shrubbery. While the rest of them were trying to look through the shrubbery, trying to find some clue as to whether people had been camping out there, um, this was the moment that Alan had that Alan had been waiting for. He, was, he got Brucon on his own, and he was tied up. But um, he pleaded to Brucon's good nature because seeing um, how the characters had conducted themselves thus far, it seemed that Brucon was. Uh, was relatively level-headed and would um, be able to be reasoned with, whereas Seth and Neris in particular, uh, quite shady, had, you know, Seth had stabbed and, like, well, had actually killed one of the captors before Malar um, used his healing magic to bring him back. Neris had used the Staff of the Rat King, which then tore apart one of the other captives. So, you know, uh, Alan was very wary of those two, but Brucon had used non had knocked out uh, two of them non-lethally, just tapped them, you know, it didn't cause them any permanent damage. And so he felt perhaps Brucon could be reasoned with. And sure enough, actually, through this, Brucon and uh, Bart the player then learned more information, uh, more than they would have got from the interrogation alone, um, that basically this is all a ruse. 
I just didn't want uh, these guys to kill me. They wanted information. If I didn't give them anything, they were going to kill me. Um, you know, please don't let them kill me. I think quite make, making Alan quite a sympathetic character. I mean, I think some in his position would probably do the same. Um, and fortunately, the Emperor Recon kind of took him under his wing a bit, I guess, put him kind of on side a little bit, showed some sympathy, and made sure that uh, no harm befell him, despite Neris being very open, in fact, encouraging them to kill Alan. Didn't actually happen. Um, meanwhile, uh, one other lovely little character moment uh, was for uh, Midge, our guest star, with his character, uh, Howland. Howland Cragmere, who um, is also going to the ball that he is bodyguard to Lord Gant Bronn, uh, a noble from the Crow Flight, um, and has been escorting him there along with uh, his daughter and squire, uh, Lainey Cragmere. Um, and uh, after some, after a conversation with Gant, uh, who'd said basically, he, he had uh, essentially um, said that should things go south, um, they, they were making plans for when they get to um, Rackfell Manor for this banquet, which they are aware tainted wine may well be at, and so uh, there may, where, uh, may well be um, werewolves to fight up that way. Um, in part of their making pl making plans of how they're going to deal with this situation, Gant um, says to Howland basically that should anything bad happen. Uh, Gant will try to uh, try to keep Lainey safe with him, um, as she has potential. She is the future. She's only a teenager, um, which Howland took as you know a great sign. It's like his liege lord has just said, you know, has basically noted uh, noted his daughter and his daughter's has seen his daughter's abilities. When in fact, what Gant was really trying to do was basically say, um, you know, she's got a lot more years in her than you do. So you can look after yourself, Howland, and if you die, that's okay, because I'll have Lainey and, you know, she can do your job for you uh, when you're gone. That's kind of... <laughs> like, it depends which way you, you interpret it, but no, no, Gant, Gant meant it in a, in a purely um, heartless and, I mean, maybe pragmatic way? It certainly wasn't in a, in a compassionate way, for sure. It wasn't showing compassion towards the youngest. More that there was more in it for him. It, it was it was for selfish reasons, but it meant that we had this lovely moment because um, sort of Midge took to really took with that, and it, you know Howland it would react in this way. Um, that it was he went straight to to find his daughter Lainey and, and tell her you know the good news that that um, she's been noticed by the Lord and that, you know, she's doing really well and how proud he is of her. This really lovely father-daughter moment. And you then got um, Helen then decides to train her and decides to um, uh, basically try to, to get through to, to Lainey that she needs to prioritise uh, Gant Bronn, that when uh, in defence of um, their house, in defence of their liege, and in defence of their country, that she needs to uh, now start looking to uh, looking to, to do the same role as a, as a Howland to, to defend their liege lord. Um, and I made a moral persuasion check, and he didn't do particularly well. But in some ways, bad roles make good things happen. They don't always make terrible things happen. Um, I think that's one thing as a DM to bear in mind is that just because the characters rolled a natural one doesn't necessarily mean it's terrible what's happening. It could mean uh, it's hilarious, or uh, it could mean that perhaps there are some long-lasting um, repercussions, and sometimes, yes, there can be bad, but there are occasions where actually it's it's whether the character reacts positively or negatively, and actually whether that character reacts positively or negatively isn't necessarily a bad thing. It just changes the kind of the course of the conversation. And so in this case, um, when Howland was trying to convince Lainey that uh, that Gant is the priority and that she needs to look after him, because he didn't do very well in his persuasion, um, Lainey said no. No, she said uh, that she prioritizes her father, that she prioritizes um, Howland himself, that she loves him and she doesn't want any uh, any harm to befall her dad, and so she warned him to look after himself, to take care of himself and make sure he doesn't get bitten by the werewolves. She was you know, fearful for his life, essentially, and said that she would sooner defend her dad than defend this lord who hasn't really treated either of them very well. 
So it was a touching little moment <laughs> there. Um, also, I think the first time in this campaign so far we've had the whole, had the L word dropped, the L bomb. I love you, Dad. I mean, obviously, different kind of love to you know, between two uh, uh, two romantic partners, but I'm sure and that may well come into play much later in the campaign. <laughs> but it was still a, a nice tender moment, which uh, we don't get that many of in the in the campaign so thus far. But uh, yeah, I for one thought it was a really nice moment. So anyway, um, when the uh, the rest of the party, um, those pursuing this red herring or the rat herring, as it's otherwise known. Uh, by the way, Session 22, The Rat Herring, is now up on our YouTube channel. Uh, there's a link to that uh, down the uh, Twitch page. Um, if you're not already watching that, go watch it. Uh, especially for what happens in the last bit of the episode, which I'm just about to talk about. So, when um, the, uh, the, par the part of the party who've been going after this Red Herring arrive back uh, at the inn, Basically, um, they all decide they need to get some rest before, um, because time is pressing on and they will need to move on within six or seven hours to, um, to get back on the road to make it to this ball in time. And um, Seth, I think James, as much as Seth, his character, had noted, what's going on with Neris? She's being really dark and shifty and I don't like it. So... I will talk a bit more about this in our final uh, campaign diary of uh, of the year, which will be this time next week, um, as uh, this story hasn't been completely uh, told yet. But essentially, um, I can tell you now that uh, Marta and I had uh, had some private conversations, sort of away from the rest of the group, um, because of well. Some of it I touched on in an earlier campaign diary when she first we had this one moment with where I got all the rest of the players to leave and it was just Marta and myself left in the room to go through this little moment of what happens to Neris. Um, and basically, uh, in part of that conversation, we'd agreed that while that when she comes back because she had some scheduling stuff because she's a busy, successful person, um, that when she was back for the two weeks in December that depending on where the party were, I'd have her come back as herself, but with some alteration, uh, which I'll talk about more next week. But uh, this was a this was great for um, uh, for Marta because then she got to role play um, Neris in a bit of a different way and to sort of like drop these subtle hints. So we were kind of playing a game within a game. There was a game which the two of us were playing, the rest of the group didn't know what was going on. Um, which was a lot of fun, like meta, not meta gaming. It was a game within a game, but it wasn't meta game. It was a different scenario. But anyway, I'll talk more about that in the next uh, session. But going back to um, our characters, so Seth had noticed that uh, something wasn't right here, and he decided to confide in the Oberyn about this um, and Fleeting Look because, <laughs> despite his love hate relationship, Fleeting Look um, does behave uh, kind of like a very loyal best friend in his very strange way and I think Seth recognised in this instance that meant that Fleeting Look could definitely be trusted so he uh, he takes them away to confide in them privately uh, in, in the Oberyn's room basically um, uh, voicing his concerns about Neris um, that she's willing to kill that she can, and basically to ask once again for the Oberyn to um, check her over um, or whether he has any alternative suggestions. Now, unfortunately, Marshall wasn't here this week, uh, who plays the Oberyn, so it meant that um, I had to play the Oberyn, but perhaps that worked for in Seth's favour, uh, James's favour, because it meant that he was then asking the DM, you know, in, in a metagaming kind of way, asking the DM, what's going on? <laughs> Can you give me any more information? Um, which I, I was unwilling to give much more information. I don't think I gave anything more than the Oberyn would already know, but... Uh, basically, yeah, um, had this this plot almost. They're cons conspiring as to what they should do, and they wanted to. Uh, one of the theories that came out, and yes, it was me as the Oberyn came out with this theory, was that perhaps the staff itself. Actually, no, this may have been touched on in the last session. By no, it was by the players, including Marshall. So I expanded on this um, that perhaps the staff itself is cursed. And that's the inhibitor. That's what's stopping Neris using her powers. 
or perhaps it's having some other nefarious effect on her which the rest of them can't see because the Oberyn has uh, has um, eldritch vision essentially I forget what it's called so, uh, eldritch sight sorry meaning he can cast detect magic at will which is great um, for debunking a lot of magical traps and other stuff like that that means he can, you know he can scan the area within 30 feet and he can see anything that's got a magical aura with a with an outline around it now Neris as a sorcerer has always had an aura around her and so that's been no different um, when he's looked at her it's been the same just a mixture of all the different um, schools of magic because essentially she's a housing unit for magic of all kinds so um, uh, so so that didn't look any different to him and he hadn't been able to deduce anything different and he looked at the staff and he, he did again in this session and it's a staff it's a conjuration staff it conjures swarms of rats so just the school of conjuration coming off of it Not, but then curses can't be detected with detect magic it's a different effect unless it's a magical curse of some variety then perhaps but i'd say that curses slightly different in the same as divine presence such as fey fiends undead different kind of presence they can be detected with divine sense but they wouldn't be able to be uh, seen with detect magic for instance um so the three of them kind of hatch a plan that they need to get the staff away from neris and um little do they know that neris has chosen the room next door and has been listening through the wall i mean they're only wooden uh wooden flats essentially between the room so it's pretty pretty easy to hear through uh, here's the entire conversation and she decides that Seth's going to be a bit of a problem so, uh, uh, Leobrin as well but Seth seems to be the instigator and so she decides that she wants to maybe get rid of them so uh, <laughs> I know player on player uh, but it makes sense it will, I promise you it will make complete sense come uh, next session on Monday but anyway she then, uh, noticing that everyone else has gone to bed, uses her staff to summon a swarm of rats, and she wants the rats to go under the door and basically go and attack. Uh, actually, no, she didn't want them to attack Seth, first of all. She wanted them to go and uh, see if uh, she could find something of his. Uh, I th essentially, I think Marta was looking to mm, frame Seth for something, although this never came to be, because the... Once the, the swarm of rats was summoned, I then made them do a stealth check, and it was a natural one. So they made a lot of noise trying to get under the door, and immediately Seth's like, oh, what the fuck is this? Opens the door, and there's Neris with the staff. Oh, dear. She, <laughs> she then continues to command the rats to attack him. And it's, uh, yeah, what, I, what I myself hadn't realised at the time, what Marta was doing, and she played this game very well, was that she was trying to she was actually trying to get the others to turn against Seth because she'd recognized and she explained this to me on messaging afterwards that she'd recognized that Seth um, was already a bit on a limb to the mo to most of the party he had alienated himself from a lot of the group because of the, his tendencies uh, his his uh, affinity for violence essentially his predisposition for violence that he uh, solved most of his problems by killing things um, Again, it makes sense in Seth's background that uh, he's uh, did a lot of monster hunting uh, and the like, and so uh, and before that, uh, fighting with pirates and blah blah blah. I won't talk. I won't talk about all the backstory stuff because that stuff's all going to come out later on, hopefully. Um, but basically, yeah, it made sense in his past that you know he would kind of stab first and ask questions later a lot of the time. Quite a shady rogue. But this had put him at odds with members of the party, mostly. Um, people like Malar and uh, Leobrin, occasionally Brucon as well. I, I like to think Brucon because of his views of the balance, which is uh, kind of a philosophy, it's, it's a philosophy as much as it's a religion uh, that the monks, the Barkfang Monastery follow and other monasteries in the many lands follow this idea of the balance, that he's kind of a, a good anchor point, a good center point. He's a good judge to be to say, hmm, this is right, hmm, this is wrong, oh, I'm not sure. Do the ends justify the means? He's usually kind of chairing and in the middle of these kind of philosophical and ideological issues whereas uh leobrin is very much uh, he strikes me and, and marshall will probably disagree with me on this but he strikes me as being a, a classical kind of lawful good character in that he's like you know we're heroes we must do good things because 
this is what we do. Uh, it may well, I think with Leovran, it's more that he aspires to be a hero. And so therefore he feels he must do that. If I want to be a hero, I've got to do the right thing. And the right thing is doing this because that's what heroes do. Um, which is quite a lawful good, I would say, trait. And then you've got Malar, who uh, also says, well, is very um, black and white, very, very much, this is right, this is wrong. Um, but he does it through a divine, through a uh, pi piety filter. Uh, the fact that, you know, he is a man of the cloth, but he follows the age, you know, this is, this is, this is of the age, or this isn't of the age. Uh, and anything that he interprets as being against his religion is bad. Uh, so you've got some quite strong characters and strong views and because of that it means that Seth and Malar we've seen before have kind of played off against each other because Seth uh, will um, do bad things to get good results uh, whereas Malar will be very much against that uh, if it's he won't do a bad thing he won't do anything that's considered bad in the eyes of the gods because that would be against his religion and it would be against the gods themselves of which he serves and that feels wrong to him um so yeah group dynamic love it <laughs> goods compared to neutrals um so yeah seth has put himself at odds with most of the party and some of the more extreme stuff um in particular has isolated him a bit so um killing one of the captives I didn't realize that James actually wanted to knock him out eventually. Well, he well he said he wanted to knock him out by stabbing him in the shoulder. But my I've explained this before that basically when characters decide they want to do non-lethal damage, you don't stab somebody to do non-lethal damage, because yeah, you could I don't know chop an arm off or something, and that wouldn't necessarily kill them outright. However, they're then going to be bleeding on the floor, uh, and they could very easily bleed out and die. So. I don't think you can knock somebody out by slashing at them with a sword. You can hit them with the butt of the sword and bruise them and, you know, a bit of um, <laughs> cognitive realignment, maybe, knocking them out. But actually uh, using the pointy end isn't a way to knock somebody out. Nah, that doesn't work. So um, anyway, he stabbed th this uh, guy in the shoulder, but then he critted. So uh, or he did a lot of damage. I said, well, actually, you, you, you're so zealous, you've slit his throat. And he just starts bleeding out on the floor. So this is the latest in a series of things where Seth's gone a bit too far. He's been a bit too, um, uh, what's the word? Uh, I was, was going to say boisterous, but it's more than that. Um, a, a bit too overzealous, there we go, with his uh, with his damage dealing. Um, so he's kind of the weak link in the party, and Nerys recognised this. And so she basically was trying to get him to attack her so that then she could get everyone else to see that he's attacked her and get him kind of punted out of the out of the group because he's been a bit of a problem um for her and so he tries she tries this and because of her abilities uh, when the others appear howl and cragmo being first to appear it kind of kind of works most of the group are very convinced by this the only one who immediately is who isn't convinced other than seth is brucon and that's because again brucon being bit suspicious of things decides to nonchalantly stealthily enter the tavern a bit later on his own but also to get away from the group he questions the long forgotten and very intelligent venerable rat nibbles that the party have brought along and has been in uh has been within brucon's robes for quite some time uh kind of questions him on what his take on the rat king staff and he learns more information about the staff and about the rat king who they uh, stole it from uh and basically he learns categorically that the staff itself doesn't curse people it doesn't um it didn't cause any ill effects to its its former master it was um it's just an item a powerful item but no curse as far as he's aware on it so, so when he stealthily enters into the tavern he hears what's going on but he's um dubious about both Nerys and uh, Seth he doesn't trust either of them at this point um so then we see the whole thing just kind of uh accelerates um it's kind of like a like a, a an arms race essentially as more characters start appearing and, go, I don't, I don't, and getting involved um so Leo Brin appears uh, and he's saying I think we should take the staff away I think we should break the staff um fleeting look appears and immediately takes Seth's side um and Seth <laughs> 
fair play to um, to James and and, uh, and his character Seth going tie both of us up if you don't trust us tie us both up and then you can question both of us just just to make sure that nobody's trying to kill anyone um, and so he gets tied up but Neris managed to avoid getting tied up and at this point um, Eobrin decides to very sensibly go and fetch Malar who has been sleeping for most of this time and avoided the red herring and so on just by sleeping um, and the trigger for waking up Malar again this is just lovely role playing throughout this uh, this this little bit of the episode um, it was that Malar was only awoken from his deep sleep by Eobrin going Seth's going to stab Neris <laughs> Because knows that's a trigger for Mala, because Mala d isn't very trustful of Seth and quite protective of Neris. So those two combined, got to sort that out. Uh, and he's up and he gets involved. And because um, Mala had leveled up at this point, he then had some spell slots, and that means he had he could cast Zone of Truth, the perfect spell for this situation. And that way he can cross uh, uh, he can cross interrogate both uh, Neris and Seth. Seth gives his recount of the situation, but uh, because uh, Neris failed her charisma save she can't lie so instead she tries to dodge the question and this in itself looks suspicious and and it gets to a point where um, she's basically backed into a corner where she can't get out of it unless she unless she tells the truth and she doesn't want to do that um, so when Malar asks what are you or who are you I think it's what are you actually <laughs> Neris what are you um, and she decides to just attack Malar, just hit him, and she does a butt ton of damage. Um, actually, I realised that um, Dan, uh, that DK had miscalculated. Actually, she did more damage. She did thirty-one points of damage, not twenty-nine, which uh, in two hits, just two surprise hits out of nowhere, bam! Like sucker punches him, but no weapon, just slams into him, sucker punches him, uh, does thirty-one points of damage, which would kill the Oberyn outright, but that's not hard, but would, uh, <laughs> sorry, the Oberyn, but um, that would knock out most of the party, but Malar now only has eight hit points. So because he leveled up, he is still up just. And that is where we left things, that she attacked him, the rest of the party are there. Seth was tied up, but on watching the episode back, because there's a lot of people talking at the same time, Midge, who plays Howland, says that he's gonna untie, um, He's going to untie Seth whilst I think some of the other party members were talking about other things. He does actually say that. So, beginning of next time, Seth will be untied. They'll all be facing off against Neris. Player versus player? Martin won't be here, but I will be uh, playing as Neris for, um, <laughs> for Monday. Um, and all, more, all will be revealed. So I've, I feel like I've given some away through this campaign diary, but that's what it's for. But everything will become crystal clear in the next uh, campaign diary, which will be this time next week. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of an interesting moment. Again, kind of got derailed from the um, from the central quest at the moment, which is getting to this bull and stopping the werewolf uh, outbreak. Um, but still, a lot of fun was had, and uh, this has been a ticking time bomb that I that the uh, that uh, Marta and I have talked about, and I've been kind of playing with and planning this for nearly a couple of months now i think it's nearly two months um since uh since net yeah it was session 13 so it would have been um now it's gonna be session 23 next week so it's 10 sessions so that's over two months ago when neris first uh, died um she went she then disappeared from the party i think a few weeks after that so this has been planned out for at least a month now I didn't think it was going to play out just yet, but as you know, as with D and D, you you can't guarantee when these things are going to happen. Um, but when they do, better be ready for it. And if you're not ready for it, ready to improvise. Um, <laughs> so um, it's not it's 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 rewarding to see this particular uh, little side plot play out. The ramifications of this will be felt next week, uh, and I look forward to seeing the how the party deal with the quandary that's just going to come up in the next session anyway um i think that'll wrap things up for session 22 
Um, as I said, um, so big announcement on Monday, which is uh, when our next session will be and our final one of 2019. So big announcement of uh, other stuff to do with the stream and exciting stuff for 2020 and beyond. Please join me for that. That's uh, Monday here on the channel from 6 p.m. Uh, and Campaign Diary will also be back uh, this time next Friday that's from 6 p.m. here on the channel for our final wrap-up of 2019 and what we've seen so far in the campaign. Uh, once again, uh, thank you all so much for tuning in, for supporting the channel. Please continue to do so. Please tell your friends. Uh, if you enjoy this and you know others that, who will enjoy our campaign, get them to come and join with us and join in the conversation uh, and have a merry old time with the rest of us live uh, from 6 p.m. on Monday here on the channel. And until then, stay safe and have a great weekend. Bye.